Thanks for staying with us. At least uh, 15 people have died from Saturday's gas tanker explosion in Boxburg. The truck carrying liquefied petroleum gas exploded after catching fire when it got stuck under a bridge about 100 meters from the hospital. It's alleged that uh, the driver tried to warn people to move away as the truck it was carrying gas. Now let's unpack this with Stan Bezadenboot, who's a crash consultant expert. Stan, a pleasure to have you on the program despite the circumstances. Now, uh, this accident has started a debate concerning the causes and the effects of such an explosion and what may have led to this accident, with uh, some experts warning already that it could have been avoided. Uh, are accidents of this nature common? Well, firstly, Merry Christmas and, and the same to your viewers. Um, well, the fact is that accidents of this kind is unfortunately common, um, but of course there are a variety of factors that lead to them, so each one has their own dynamics, but it's not an unseen type situation. We've had several historical cases where there were major explosions involved, uh, such as the one that we had on the N1 north towards Polokwane, which is some of your viewers might even remember. So the gas tanker, which had been traveling from the free state, sustained damage when passing under a low bridge. And the vehicle's release valve apparently caught on the bridge and uh, a fire started there. Now, in a safety management system, risk management plays a key role for the prevention of such accidents. Uh, talk to us about the importance of uh, truck companies uh, having a safety management model and, more importantly, ensuring that their staff adhere to these rules. So it's, it's such an important point and it's very unfortunate that it's not being followed by all, all operators. As an example, we do what are called videographic tactical route risk assessments. So before you send any dangerous goods, dangerous chemicals, high value uh, cargo or even just high value assets uh, along a particular route, it's ideal that you have somebody conduct a so-called tactical or technical survey on that route to identify the various risks that might manifest along that route. Also then out of that comes issues such as the size of the vehicles, the route, the, uh, you know, the socioeconomic issues, uh, areas that are perhaps you know, so-called flashpoints for public unrest, low bridges, overhanging electric lines, etc. And from this analysis, you would then get a final product that enables the operator to train their staff on the proper use of that route and the risks they face there. In addition to that, you've got to have systems and mechanisms in place. As an example, it should be protocol that the minute a vehicle departs from its intended route, there's a technology with GPS uh, tracking systems now called geofencing. With geofencing, you have the ability to detect that the vehicle is departing from its route and there should be some kind of interaction. If it's unplanned and scheduled, the driver should be trying to contact his operator, controller or employer or perhaps even the, the operator of, of the, uh, the service and to say, look, I'm forced to deviate from my route or I'm lost or I'm not on the correct route. I find myself in unfamiliar territory and then there should be mechanisms and processes in place to manage that. It is rather involved, it can get rather technical and it's not like this kind of knowledge is, you know, dime a dozen. So you do need specialized consultants to help you establish these kinds of protocols, but it's essential, especially if we have the wisdom of hindsight, such in this case, where we've lost 15 lives that potentially could have been avoided. Stan, let's discuss the relationships among the main causes that uh, may have contributed to what occurred in that incident yesterday. Safe to say this was a freak accident. And while I do understand that yours isn't to investigate this particular accident, uh, from your own observations, what would you say are some of the contributing factors that may have uh, led to this accident? So invariably you want to start at the so-called tip of the spear, which is unfortunately the driver, the person that operates a vehicle. No one has better control over the direction of that vehicle than the driver. So you would invariably start with the driver and with the actions taken by the driver, the choices he made, the directions he went in. As an example, if a driver is properly trained, properly equipped or properly, um, you know, let's say equipped, let's say for instance I'm operating a vehicle, one of the things I definitely need to know is the height of that vehicle. If I change vehicles often, that height should be affixed to the interior of the windshield somewhere where a driver can immediately see it and constantly be reminded of it. So when I take a bend or a corner or approach a particular area where there's a low bridge and I see that bridge and the height is visible and there's a warning sign of that height, I can compare it to the height that's available to me. 
The problem, however, is that the bridge height and the road design might not be a simple uh, you know, a model. You might simply have the physical height of the edge of the bridge. So if you stood right below that bridge and took a tape measure and measured it, it might be 5.6 or 3.6 or 3.8 meters or whatever the value is. However, that's the value at that point. So if you do a forward assessment and you see that it's a steep downhill that essentially flattens out underneath the bridge, the so-called horse or the truck tractor could be entering under the bridge safely. But because the trailer is trailing on the downward ramp, yeah. it could create a situation where the trailer is higher while it's not by design higher. So that's very important. So then you go to that vehicle design and the way it's designed, the implications, which brings us back to that root risk, risk assessment. It's not simply just a value. It's a value in a complex environment. Then you've got to look at the, in this particular example, you've got to look at the way in which, uh, you know, the, the, the scenario was handled. It's true that uh, I've heard comments from the employer that the driver had been driving for seven years, but he might not have been crashing the bridges for seven years. So maybe um, he's not prepared, skilled, trained, or perhaps experienced in handling situations of this in the physical sense where he is personally at risk. Under those conditions, he needs to take certain actions. Let's say he took those actions. Then the emergency services would arrive. Now, just on that issue, I want to highlight a few points here that I think your viewers might not be aware of. We are, in fact, talking about LP gas. There are several different gases that are capable of a, let's call it an explosion, which is called the blevy, which is a boiling, boiling liquid expanding vapor explosion, which is what we saw with this big ball of flame. Now, there are certain protocols and certain, uh, let's call it, response tables available, such as in the emergency services or the emergency res response guidebook. And just as an example, I'm reading from this manual right now. If we assume this truck to have a diameter of 2.1 meter on the fuel container and a length of 11.8 meters, it means it's capable of, tra of, con of, of carrying 42,000 liters of this material. This means that it has a weight of 16.8 tons. Under those conditions, if emergency services respond, the emergency response distance is supposed to be uh, 306 meters. The minimum evacuation distance for that particular environment would then be 1,149 meters or a kilometer. And the ideal prefer preferred evacuation distance would be literally 2.2 kilometers. Now, keep in mind that the hospital is only physically about 100 meters away yeah. from the scene. So if the, uh, the protocols could have been executed, I, I, I have heard timelines. I've heard that the fire department was present for 30 minutes from one witness. I've heard 52 minutes from another witness. And then just coincidentally, they need to deploy water at a rate of, just to clarify here, of 1,994 liters a minute to cool that system with that much fuel there. So if there was enough time for the protocols to be, in, uh, to be, to be uh, initiated, and if people could be evacuated over a wide enough area, this could have been avoided, perhaps at least the, 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 the bulk of the injuries to the members of the public. And then also, in addition, you want to ask the next question, and that is, I heard a witness say, that it's when they tried to move the truck out from under the bridge that the explosion occurred. I have no way of knowing whether that's true, so it would have to be examined. But if that is the case, it means that we had a vehicle that's potentially on fire, sold with up to 40 to 40,000 liters of mm. low pressure gas or LP gas being moved while it's on fire. That has to be a risk. So I think as much as we look at these dynamics, we've got to consider those and then finally we come back to obviously the operator, the owner of the truck. The question is what mechanisms did they have in place? What were the mechanisms they deployed before the route was encountered? Was there a forward intelligence report in the form of a route risk assessment? Yeah. How did that risk, risk, risk assessment manifest in this case? And what protocols were actually followed? So it's a complex case, but I definitely think some elements at the very least uh, are subject to scrutiny. And then on the other side, unfortunately, some probably or possibly could have been avoided. But Stan, is there a simulation that uh, trucking companies can indeed use to clarify to their drivers how to manage the key factors to ensure that the drivers themselves and their vehicles are indeed safe, especially for vehicles carrying hazardous materials like the one that we saw? Mm -hmm. 
well, why there might, while there might not be many examples of simulations, because the ideal simulation would, would uh, you know, include an actual product and real risk, such as fire training. But we provide a driver training or training to truck drivers, both from the tactical perspective, so as in hijacking avoidance, and from the response and reaction as the first person on the scene. So I would definitely uh, suggest or propose that a good idea would be for companies to allow drivers more time in training because often, and it's unfortunate and I fully understand why, a truck driver is a person who has a license, he's qualified to operate a truck, therefore you hire him, you place him on a truck, and as long as he carries on operating the truck and making no you know, intentional accidents, he's considered a good driver because he's had no, had no incidents for X number of years. It's when things go wrong that those people are not necessarily qualified, yeah. experienced or trained in, in the mechanisms they can deploy. And, and the fact is that they need to consider to mitigate their own risk. Stan Bezadenhout, he's a crash consultant expert, of course, speaking to us about that uh, accident out in Boxburg. And the update there uh, being that uh, up to 15 people have been killed in that uh, tragic uh, accident or in the aftermath of that accident. Let's get